This video has two ideas to share. The first idea concerns yield, aka yield to maturity, and yield-based duration as a popular risk measure. The first idea is to show you exactly what is their primary limitation, and that is that they necessarily imply a parallel shift in the yield curve. And then the second idea is to show you the most common type of non-parallel shift in the yield curve, which are called twists. And a twist can be either a steepening or a flattening, and we'll define steepening and flattening in very specific terms. I've constructed here in a spreadsheet that you can download an unrealistically linear yield curve that starts at 3% for the six month spot rate and then goes in a straight line to 4% at the 10 year spot rate. You may have noticed in the financial press when they talk about whether the yield curve has inverted or might invert, they do tend to define that slope in simple terms. The most common probably being the spread or difference between a 10 year treasury bond and a three month treasury bill. So with that definition here as the baseline, underneath this, I show key statistics for three bonds. All three bonds have the same face value of 100 and same coupon of 6%. I have a short, medium, and barely long-term bond of 1, 5, and 10 years. Again, all 6% coupon so that I can solve with this spot rate curve for the respective prices at my baseline here in blue. And then I'm also showing the yield, which unless we otherwise specify, always means yield to maturity. That's our single factor measure. And then I'm also showing duration. Here it happens to me, Macaulay duration, the most common single factor measure of sensitivity or price risk. So blue will, blue will be the baseline, and then orange will re, the orange dashed line will represent the destination that the curve shifts to. And first, I highlight the uh, important weakness of the single factor measure primarily yield-based duration. After all, duration is implicitly a yield-based duration, such that let's imagine I'm using this duration to explore a dramatic shock of 1% 1 or 100 basis points. I've got these pre-programmed in the scenarios, and now my baseline again is in blue, and we shift to the dash orange. This is a parallel shift of plus 100 basis points or 1%. And you'll notice each of my bonds as expected, their price drops. And in fact, as also expected, the durations are fairly good approximations. We know they're not exact, but especially at the short, for the short bond of one year, that 1% shock to the yield translated in fact to a 1% shock or decline in the price. For five years, my 4.43, it's pretty close to a 4.2% drop, that is 4.43 multiplied by 1%. And my 10-year, not quite as accurate, but not terrible as well, if we keep in mind that this is a Macaulay duration and therefore will be higher than the modified duration. So not too bad, the price, not too bad as far as, far, as far as an approximation of the actual shock to the bond price is 7.3%. However, here's the key point. It's the converse logic that really constrains us when we operate with the duration. And what I mean by that is, when we use duration, we shock a yield, right? Yield-based duration. And implicitly, there is no way around the fact that we are assuming a parallel shift in the yield curve. Let me say once more, because this is very easy for new learners to miss, about the limitation of the single factor measure that is duration and also convexity as well. The key limitation is that when we use it to shock the duration to explore the sensitivity of the bond's price to that shock to yield, because yield is a single factor measure, we implicitly are assuming a parallel shift. Doesn't matter what the shape of our baseline curve is. That does not need to be linear, it could be anything, as long as in this case, we're assuming a 1% shock to the yield, 
There's no way around. It's a single, we're using a single factor to characterize the whole curve. There's no way around that this implicitly is an assumption of a parallel shift in the yield curve. And you can run this with lots of different scenarios and you'll find that that whatever we change for the yield is going to be very closely approximated by a parallel shift of the same magnitude. That's the key limitation. And here, uh, my, other, my other scenario shows a shock to the downside here, a 1% drop, and you can see my yields drop as well, although it's the converse logic that's most interesting is the fact that changing the yield assumption is tantamount to a parallel shift in the yield curve, and that leads to the question of what do we do when we want to overcome that single factor limitation? Well, we go to the multi-factor models that are more sophisticated because they um, can model non-parallel shifts in the curve. That's really the basic distinction when you first go into fact fixed income risk. We study, we spend a lot of time studying these single factor measures, and then it's important to be mindful of the fact that oh, implicitly, those are parallel shift. There is no other way to describe the sophisticated curve by a single factor than to assume it's a parallel shift. And then we can step into the more sophisticated world of multi-factor models. So if the curve doesn't shift in parallel, well, it can shift lots of different ways, but for both success historically, there's really two types, a twist, or a butterfly. We're not doing butterflies here. We'll do twists, which are um, the most commonly studied, and twists include steepening or flattening. So steepening or flattening are the most common explorations of non-parallel shifts. And so now let's look at a steepening, and the most intuitive steepening is probably when the long-term rate increases by more than the short-term rate, and that's what I've done here, right? Solid blue is our baseline. Dashed orange is where we shift to. And you can see this is non-parallel. This is a steepening because the long-term rate here increased by 100 basis points, which was more than the short-term rate. So that's the obvious definition of a steepening. And now you'll see that our, if we depended on duration, it's going to be not a variable, rely, it's not a reliable risk measure for us when the shift is not in parallel. The one-year bond doesn't suffer much at all, but the 10-year bond does very much. Okay, my next scenario is another steepening, also somewhat intuitive, and this is when, again, starting from solid blue base going to dashed orange. This is a steepening because the long-term rate dropped by less than the short-term rate dropped by. In this case, 20 basis points drop in the long-term is less than the 100 basis points drop in the short run, and visually that looks like a steepening. And again, duration-based, uh, it may or may not comport with your expectation, but our long-term bond benefits the most in terms of price appreciation. They all benefit. Being a long position in a bond is beneficial when rates decline. Okay, so those are the obvious cases of steepening, and then if we go to flattening, obvious case here, again, started with the three going up to four. Flattening is when the long-term rate drops by more than the short-term rate. In this case, 100 basis points drop by more than only a 20 basis point drop. These are also drops here. And as you might expect, the 10-year bond benefits the most in terms of price appreciation. Next scenario for flattening, this time the rates all go up. But if the long-term rate goes up less then the short term rate, then we have a flattening. In this case, only 20 basis points is less than 100 basis points. Visually, that looks like a flattening here. And notice our duration measures aren't really very helpful. To me, somewhat counterintuitively here, the five-year bond, our medium rate bond, suffers the most in terms of the price depreciation. After all, the 10-year bond has most of its principal right here where there's not much of a increase. So I showed you the intuitive definitions, and then I just want to fi finish here by uh, showing you the uh, unintuitive implications of these definitions. I am, for those in the FRM, I am strictly following Bruce Tuckman's definition. 
having explored the intuitive scenarios around steepening and flattening, which again are forms of curve twists, which are non-parallel changes. Now let me show you the unintuitive applications or scenarios of steepening and flattening. And I'm following Bruce Tuckman's definition here that comports with the FRM. But the difference here is I'm starting with an inverted yield curve. Now this time I have a 4% at the short rate and a 3% at the long rate. And now we'll look at a steepening because we're going to be faithful to the definition. We're going from solid blue inverted to the dashed orange. And you'll notice this is in fact a steepening because consistent with that first definition, the long-term rate increased by more than the short-term rate, right? This is not intuitive because we graph, and this is a point Tuckman makes. We look at this and might, if we visually inspect this, might think this is a um, flattening, but it's not. This is a steepening because the long-term rate increases by 100 basis points, which is more than the short-term rate. And consistent with that definition of a steepening, the 10-year bond suffers the most in terms of price appreciation. Okay, now the, now the non-intuitive flattening. I go back to my inverted baseline, and then this is a flattening here because the long-term rate dropped by more than the short-term rate. Again, graphically, we might think this is a steepening, but it's the fact that the long-term rate drops by 100 basis points, but the short-term rate only drops by 20 basis points that makes this a flattening and consistent with that, with the earlier scenario and definition of flattening, the 10-year bond price appreciates the most. This long-term bond benefits the most from a flattening, regardless of whether where we started on this initial yield curve. So those are the two counterintuitive uh, uh, applications of that same one definition of steepening and flattening. So I hope that's helpful. You. If you like the video, please subscribe to the channel and then you'll get notified of my next video. Thank you.